morning. Good evening. Very happy to welcome all of you again tonight as we continue this series on revelations from the throne of God. We looked at the other night uh, where John was invited to come up into the throne room, and he told him, he said, we will show you things to come. And everything in the book of Revelation thereafter is from the throne room. All the things that we talk about, you'll find those beings in the throne room are involved, such as the four living creatures, such as the 24 elders, angels, and so forth. All those are there in the throne room, and they're the ones that are ministering to John and telling him what's to take place. So this particular series, we're looking at Revelation, the fourth chapter through the twelfth chapter. That's what we're looking at as we talk about different things that was shown John. And this evening, uh, we're taking a look at the 144,000. Now, the 144,000 are still part of the seals because we talked about the seven seals, and the seven seals cover the sixth chapter of Revelation and over into the first chapter of the eighth the first verse of the eighth chapter. So they cover six, seven, first, cha first verse of the eighth chapter. And tonight we're looking at the seventh chapter on the 144,000. Tomorrow evening, tomorrow evening our presentation is entitled Seven Trumpets. Seven Trumpets. Uh, this, you will find, is God's warning. And we're going to talk about the seven trumpets and what the Scripture has to say about it, I would suggest that tomorrow night's subject is not really too good of a subject for small children. I would just simply suggest that because there are some pretty serious things in that, seventh, uh, in that chapter on the seven trumpets. So, uh, you want to Follow carefully as we talk about it, because it's very, very important. But tonight, the 144,000 are God's people, and the sealing of them, and what all's involved in them. And so, I'm sure you'll find it, I hope, encouraging, as the Scripture shows what's going to take place and happen just before Jesus comes. And as best I can tell from the study of Revelation, folks, you and I are living at that time. So all of you that are watching by television or listening on the radio or taking care of it through the Internet, we're glad to welcome you here, and we hope you'll enjoy the presentation as we go into it tonight. Uh, we're very, very happy to have Pam and Jimmy Rhodes with us. They're always special guests for us, and we appreciate that very much. Pam is singing tonight a song entitled Calvary, talks about sacrifice of Jesus for you and for me. But before she sings tonight, Chuck Algar is going to come out, and he's going to read about the 144,000. The 144,000 will cover the seventh chapter, and it will cover five verses in the 14th chapter. Those two chapters is what will be involved, the seventh chapter and five verses in the 14th chapter as we talk about the 144,000. Well, if you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to go right to the Bible. And if you have your Bibles, we're going to read Revelation chapter 4, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 7, and then we're going to read Revelation chapter 14, 1 through 5. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 7, then we'll skip over to Revelation chapter 14. Let's read together. After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted, to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. 
of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with the palm branches in their hand, and crying with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders, and four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where do they come from? And I said to me, I, and he said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who came out of great tribulation, and washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he sits on the throne and dwells among them. They shall neither hunger any more or thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the lamb who is in the midst of them will shepherd them and lead them to the fountains of living waters. And God shall wipe away every tear for their eyes. Chapter 14. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, with him 144,000, having his father's names written in their foreheads. And I heard the voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of thunder, and I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These are redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. In their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. May God add his blessing to his word tonight. Amen. There were three crosses raised on Calvary. Only one held the Son of God. His only crime, he pardoned sin like mine. Now I praise him. For he set me free
Father in heaven, tonight, as we open your word, we pray that you, your Holy Spirit, may be present. We ask, Lord, that we each might see and understand what you have revealed in your word. We're thankful for the promises, for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, and for the assurance that our salvation is secure in him. For these things we ask in the name of our Savior. Amen. The 144,000, who are they? Why are they a special group? What does the Scripture have to tell us about them? To begin with, let me just say that the 144,000 and what it has to say here in the seventh chapter is kind of an interlude that is put in between the 13th and 14th verses of the sixth chapter. Okay? Did you follow me on that? What is given in the seventh chapter is kind of an interlude that goes in between the 13th and 14th chapter, a verse of the sixth chapter, because that's where it comes down and talks about what takes place, and then after that comes the coming of Christ. And so this fits right in there, and that kind of helps you and I know where we are in the stream of time, what, what's taking place. So we find here it says, After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. So we have four angels. We've come through the sixth chapter. God has made it clear to John what's going to happen to the wicked, what's going to take place. And then he says, these four angels are holding back the winds of strife. That's what they're doing. They're holding it back. And dear friends, as far as God's Word is concerned, you and I are living in the time in which they're holding back the winds of strife. The wind, in Bible prophecy, represents war, strife. A noise will come to the ends of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead His case with all flesh. He will give those who are wicked to the sword, says the Lord. So it says the Lord has a controversy with the nations. This is what He's going to do. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, disaster shall come forth from nation to nation, and a great what? Whirlwind shall be raised up from the farthest parts of the earth. So here God uses a whirlwind to represent war, strife. It's coming on the people. Another text that says, Behold, I raise up against Babylon, against those who dwell in Lab, Kamai, a destroying wind. So we find the wind represents war and strife. And God has these four angels that are holding back the winds of strife that are going to blow on the earth. And I have some question that maybe you and I are living in the time when they're slowly begin to release those winds of strife. Because things are happening today, folks, like I have never seen, not in my lifetime. And so we are at that period of time. Who are the 144,000? Who are these people? What do they represent? 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So it says 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And as you read, 12,000 from each tribe. Okay? Let me just say a word about 144,000. 144,000, as you know, is a multiple of 12 and then multiplied by 1,000. There's a lot of reason for that in the Scripture because you'll find that even the armies of Israel were divided by thousands. This is something that used, and it represented God's people. Does it mean Jews? 
Does it mean that this 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe of Israel, does that mean they are literal Jews? How are we to look at this when it speaks of 144,000? Because there are some people that believe that it is literal Jews that will be here and take place and all that. Let's see what the Scripture has to say. Jesus said to the children of Israel, your house is left unto you desolate. When they refused to accept him, rejected him as the Savior, as the Messiah, he told them, your house is left unto you desolate. And you remember, as he hung there on the cross, the veil in the temple that separated the holy and the most holy place, that veil began to tear at the top and tore all the way to the bottom, and the way into the most holy was open and showing that the sacrifices and the offerings and the ceremonial system that the Jewish people had practiced for centuries had come to an end, that the Savior had died, that the Lamb of God had been offered, and that whole system was to come to an end. Now, folks, there is no way to describe what took place here, because with the ending of that, something very dramatic happened, because before the gospel and what was done for mankind and salvation, all was contained within the Jewish nation. If you wanted to know about God and what He was doing, you had to basically become part of the Jewish nation. As long as it was with the Jewish nation, it was able to be contained. Another power could come down and could capture them, and they could control them and confine them, and the spread of the gospel could be contained. But when all of a sudden Jesus came and died, and that was no longer contained within the Jewish people, but every individual, no matter who they were, could accept him and become a child of God, there was no longer Jew and Gentile. There was no longer that division. And all of a sudden the gospel was free to go to the world. And it changed the whole complex. It changed the whole scenario of things. But what you and I need to understand is the book of Revelation is full of symbolism. You have to understand that. For instance, we just studied earlier about the seven churches. There were seven churches, but those seven churches, folks, were symbols of seven periods of time and God's church on earth. That's what they read. So it was symbolic of that time. Also, it talks about Jezebel. It talks about Jezebel in the Revelation. Jezebel in Revelation is not alive. She would have to be six, seven hundred years old. Uh, but Jezebel was a real person that existed, but she's not alive in Revelation. She's symbolic. Okay, are you with me? Talks about Balaam in the book of Revelation. Balaam's not alive. Lived back, period of time, was there, but it's symbolic of something. So you find that as it talks about Revelation 11, talks about spiritual Sodom and Egypt. Revelation 18 talks about Babylon. Babylon's no longer existent in the time of the book of Revelation was written. It is symbolic, and you must look at it when we talk about the 144,000. You're going to have to understand that it has symbolic meaning. Not could be literal people, but that alone is not enough. It definitely has symbolism as all the other things do. And I want to clear up one other point. There are no lost tribes. I hear people talk about all the lost tribes. Nowhere in this book does it ever talk about the lost tribes of Israel. That doesn't exist, folks. That's just something that's been made up. The lost tribes of Israel, no. If you want to know, go to the book of Ezra. 
This is after they had been in captivity all those years. And in the book of Ezra, you find that they offered sacrifice for each one of the tribes. And they could not do that without one of those people from that tribe present because nowhere did they ever offer a sacrifice by proxy. Just didn't happen. So there's no such thing as lost tribes of Israel. That doesn't, sure, they would carry it into captivity, but it doesn't mean they didn't exist. So you need to be very, very clear on that. So what is it talking about? So then those who are of faith are blessed, blessed with believing, Abraham, for you are all sons of God through what? Faith in Christ Jesus. In other words, when you and I accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you become a child of God. You become part of spiritual Israel. You become a descendant of Abraham by faith. And the promises that God made to Abraham of old belong to you. That is what was given. Let's go on. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. No longer do we have separate there. They're all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, that means if you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Promises that God made to Abraham belong to you through Jesus Christ. That's what's given to you and to me. So when he talks about 144,000 of all the tribes of Israel, this is not talking about literal Israel. This is talking about spiritual Israel. This is talking about God's people, and there were to be 144,000. For he is not a Jew. Listen. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. He said, no, that doesn't make you a Jew. Nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. Now, that's not the way it's looked at. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. A Jew who is one inwardly, that means what I believe. And circumcision is that of the heart. In the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So, dear friends, the 144,000, as we look at it tonight, we have to look at it in the sense of God's people. Now, the number 12 is used many, many times in Scripture, as you can see here. There are 12 tribes, 12 disciples, 24 elders, 12 gates, 12 foundations, 12,000 furlongs. The number 12 represents God's kingdom. It's a kingdom number, and that's the way it is used. So when it speaks of 144,000, that is talking about God's people as a complete whole. That's what it's talking about, as a complete whole. Now, I know there's people that try and take and make it a literal number, but as far as I'm concerned, it has more to do with all of God's people that is complete and whole. It could be a literal number, but in the best meaning, it means God's people as a whole. 12,000 from each tribe representing each type of what? Character. You see, <coughs> God is putting an end to sin. God does not want to get 10,000 years into eternity and have someone say, well, Lord, uh, these people that were this particular makeup, personality, character, they just didn't make it. Uh, God doesn't intend that to happen. God said we're going to show every type of character, every type of character, and there will be 12,000 from each type. And so he lists them. You'll find that as he talks about the uh, 12 tribes, he tells their characteristics. 
Jacob, in the 49th chapter of Genesis, lists what they're like, each one. And there's a book called The Lamb that was written by Leslie Harding. Uh, in that, he describes some of their characteristics and thought you might enjoy them. Judah says he was independent. Issachar, complacent. Zebulun had itchy feet. Reuben was amorous. Simeon, sadistic. Gad, playboy. Ephraim, brilliant. Manasseh, reticent. Benjamin, uncompromising. Dan, critical. Asher, fastidious. Naphtali, impractical. This was their characteristics, their makeup. That's the way, the way they were. Now, I want you to uh, take your Bible, and I want you to turn over to the seventh chapter of Revelation that we're looking at. And as you look at the seventh chapter here, notice that this list of the sons of Jacob, which made up the 12 tribes of Israel, there's two that are missing in Revelation 7. Two that are not there. Do you know what two they are? The two that are missing here is Dan and Ephraim. Those are the two that are missing. And there's a very definite reason why they're missing. Uh, Ephraim. Ephraim was the son of who? He was the son of Joseph. Have you thought about that? He had everything he ever wanted. His father was the prime minister of the country. When it came to wealth, anything he wanted. And he grew up that way. And as you read about Ephraim, he was also one of the foremost that was leading the children of Israel into idolatry, led them away from him. Dan, critical. And friends, you and I need to take a close look at that because he will not make it into the kingdom of God because he was critical. And when you and I have a tendency to be critical of other people and criticize other people, you better write it down. And by the way, so was Judas. So they're, they're left out. They're left out. And when you, uh, this list that you have here in Revelation 7, the, that's the same list of the names that are over the gates of the new Jerusalem. And by the way, have you ever looked at what gate you're going to go through? Because according to your personality and your character, you're going to go through that gate into the city. So here you have the 144,000, each from a different type of personality. Then one of the elders answering said to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who came out of Great tribulation. Now, folks, I want to just pause on this point here, and I'll come back to it in a little bit, but I want to point out that this text in, da in Revelation 7, 14 not only applies to the 144,000, but it applies to the great multitude, not to just the 144,000. And I run on to people who try to take that and apply it just to the 144,000. No, it doesn't. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, here they are, which no one can number of all nations, tribe, people, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hand. So when you read this seventh chapter, it describes the 144,000, brings you down, and then it says, after this, there was a great number that no one can number of all the nations of the earth, clothed in white robes, what I'm trying to get across to you, yes, there's 144,000, 
but there is a great multitude of people that are saved in God's kingdom, not just the 144,000. The 144,000 are a special group of people, but they're a special group of people for a definite reason. These, and when it says these, it's talking about the great multitude came out of tribulation. They have passed through a time of tribulation. They have come out the great multitude, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Paul had this to say. And not only that, but we also glory in what? Have you done that lately? Gloried in tribulation? Okay. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance what? Character. And character, hope. Yes. Necessary to your character and mine that we go through tribulation. Because that's what it takes to develop character. And dear friend, you need to understand that the development of character takes place here, not in heaven. Amen. Amen. It takes place here, not in heaven. So you and I need to be very much aware of what God is doing. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. They were redeemed from where? Yeah. So they're individuals just like you and I. Yeah. See, they're redeemed from the earth. They're people just like us. Every different type of character so you can't say there was no chance for you because they're there, everyone from every type of character, and they sing a song that only they learn because it has to do with their experience. That's the song that they're singing, that they're the only ones that learn. What makes the 144,000 special? What makes them a special group of people? And they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's the first thing that makes them special. As they took and they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The only way you can wash your robe and make it white in the blood of the Lamb is you have to wash it in the righteousness of of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the only way that it happens is if you and I wash these lives of ours, our characters in His blood. Oh, dear friend, you and I need to be on our knees praying daily that God will change us, that He will make us into His character, into His likeness, that we would be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. These are the ones who were not defiled with women. It says they're virgins. Never married, right? Is that what it's telling you? These have not been defiled with women. What is it telling us? Well, it, we need to introduce somebody here. Revelation 17, verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abomination, the filthiness of her fornication. This is the woman that leads them. This is the woman that will lead people into adultery or fornication. This woman of Revelation 17, she's referred to as the great harlot. And therefore, this 144,000 have not been defiled by her. What does that mean? Well, a woman in Bible prophecy represents what? Church. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. 
So if he's not, they're not defiled with women, what does that tell you? It means, dear friend, that if your belief and your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is based on the church, you've got it in the wrong place. That's what it means. You see, my relationship with Christ has to be built on this. So it never changes because if you were to set out and say, well, I'm going to find the truth and set out to do it by going to churches, there's over 300 different major denominations. That's a long, long road. You and I have to go to God's Word, and I have to get into the Word and study it and find out what it says and build my faith on the Word of God, not on a church. Now, it doesn't mean that I shouldn't belong to a church. That isn't what it means at all, because the Scripture speaks of a good woman, which is a good church. But you do not find truth by a church. You find truth by the Word of God. And this, these people are those who were faithful. They had not been defiled with women because they were true to God and they followed the Word of God, for they are virgins. Simply what is telling you that they have not been defiled. How do you commit spiritual adultery? How do you do that? Well, you do it by adulterating the Word of God. That's by teaching false belief, by teaching something that does not have biblical foundation, by teaching something that is not supported by the Word of God. That is adulterating the Word of God, and that is committing spiritual adultery. And it says that these don't do that. They're virgins. And in their mouth was found what? No deceit. Are you getting a picture about these people? In their mouth was found no deceit. In other words, what it's talking about, it's talking about a special group of people that by the grace of God, he has been able to change them and change their character until in them is found no fault. Now, don't, let me just tell you right now, they're never going to know who they are. You never, you'll never find these people, 144,000, coming around saying, well, I'm one of the 144,000. If they do, you better run, <laughs> because that'll never happen. Because, dear friend, it physic or it's impossible it's impossible for you and for me as human beings because the closer you come to Christ, the more sinful you're going to appear in your own eyes. And so they're not going to come to that way, but that place, but they are to the place in their Christian experience that they are, as the Scripture says, without fault, for they are without fault before the throne of God. They have come to that place in their Christian experience so that by the grace of God, he has changed them, made them different. And I want to say this evening, folks, you and I cannot change ourselves. You can't. That's an impossibility. The Scripture says, can the leopard change its spots? No, we can't do that. But what we can do, I can spend time with the Lord. I can spend time in the Word of God. And as I spend time with Him, open my heart up to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will change you. That's His work. That's not your work. That's His work to make us different, to change our characters, to make us like Jesus Christ. 
And this 144,000 are those that that happened, that took place in their lives so that they are without fault before the throne of God. Do not harm the earth or the, the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. He said, you see, he's down here to the place where uh, all these seals have taken place and Christ is about ready to come and the great earthquake and all that's about ready to take place. And he said, don't harm the earth or anything till we have sealed the servants of a God in their foreheads. And please notice, folks, he seals them where? In the forehead. Not like the mark of the beast that can be in the forehead or in the hand. But the seal of God is placed only in the forehead. What does the seal do? What is the purpose of the seal? The purpose of the seal is two. One, it shows ownership. And two, it shows protection. Those are the two things that the seal of God does. And he said, don't, don't do anything until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Do you know what it means by sealing? When it says sealing, sealing, folks, is settling into the truth. Do you understand what I mean by that? Sealing is settling into the truth. In other words, what I mean is that I need to study, I need to spend time with the Lord Jesus Christ, so I come to the place where I say, yeah, that's truth, I know it's truth, without a question, it's the truth of God, and I am going to follow it and walk with my Lord. I'm settling into the truth. And when a person does that, that is God sealing that individual. And you've got to be settled. You've got to be sealed. You've got to be into the truth enough so that as the tribulation comes, you stand firm. You don't move. You say, yes, this is what I believe. I'll stand firm for the Word of God. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are His places the seal upon them, the Lord says, that one's mine, belongs to me. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. God is saying, these are my people. They belong to me. They're sealed. They are faithful to me. They're settled in the truth of God. This is the sealing that takes place. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. You see, the law, the law of God is a transcript of God's character. That's what it is. And since it's a transcript of God's character, and you and I must have our characters made into his likeness. That's why it's talking about bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, that it brings their life into harmony with the Word of God. Now, a seal, a seal, as I said, has authority and protection. And a seal has certain things in it. The President of the United States has a seal. As you can see here, you have the seal, the name, Abraham Lincoln. That's his name, title, president. You know what that deal does? That gives authority to it. And territory, United States. Those are the things that are in a seal. Now, if he's going to seal the law among his disciples, then is there anything in God's law that expresses this seal? That's what you've got to look at. Now, I can take the Ten Commandments, and I can take nine of them, and I can apply them to this altar. 
In other words, I can take this altar and say it's my God. And I can say, my God tells me I'm not to have any other gods before it. My God tells me I'm not to take its name in vain. My God tells me I'm to honor my father and my mother. My God tells me I'm not to kill. I can take and make that altar my God and say, I, but I cannot take the fourth commandment and do that. Because it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. That just left my altar out. You see, the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Left it out. Okay? In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor the stranger who is within your gates. Listen, for in six days the Lord made that makes him the creator again leaves out my altar he is the creator of heaven and earth his territory and the sea and all that is in them and rest of the seventh day wherefore the lord blessed the sabbath day and hallowed it that fourth commandment contains the seal of god so what's there it has his name the Lord your God, creator, title, territory, heaven and earth. That's why it says, seal the law among my disciples. And in this day and age, God is looking for people who are willing to say, yes, Lord, I'll build my faith on your word. I'll build it on what the Scripture says, and I'll stand on your word, even though the whole rest of the world may go the other direction. I'm going to follow your word. I'm going to walk in the light of your word. And God says, these are my people, and will seal them. You see, he even says that. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbath to be what? A sign or a seal, if you please to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. The Lord who does what? What does that mean? That means change your character. Follow me? That's what it means. He said, I'm the one. I'm the one that will change your character make you different. If I can take and make a day holy, I can make you holy. And he does that for us. This 144,000 are a special group of people because God has been able to work in their lives in such a way that they've come to the place that they are without fault before God. But dear friends, don't mix it up. There is a great, great multitude clothed in white robes, having palms in their hands, standing on the sea of glass. These are the redeemed. Yes, the 144,000, as it says, are the first. But it doesn't mean first in quantity. It means first in quality. They have developed characters like their Lord. That's what they've done. They are a special group of people. What is their work? These were redeemed from among men, being the what? First fruits to God and the Lamb. You see, they're the first fruits, but they're the first fruits in quality, not in, in quantity, but in quality. They have developed characters that to the God and the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God, and they serve Him day and night in His temple. This 144,000 are a special group. They serve the Lord before Him all the time. You know why? Do you know why? 
because, folks, they are living proof. They're living proof of what the grace of God can do. So down through the ceaseless ages of eternity, he can point to these people and say, look, these are the ones who so surrendered their life to me that I could work in their life and change them and make them like me. That he could do. And he said, here's living proof that it could be done out of every personality and every type that was on earth. There they are, living proof of what the grace of God could do. This is why they're there. They'll serve him. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he what? Goes. You see throughout the ceaseless age of eternity, wherever Christ goes, he can take these along and say, here, these were the ones who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones that surrendered their life, walked with me, followed me. This is the ones that I have made like unto me. So these are the 144,000. These are the special ones having their father's name written on their foreheads, sealed in their foreheads. They have the father's name. That means they're like him in character. That's what that means. And so, dear friend, tonight, you and I have the privilege of so surrendering our life to Jesus Christ that he can do his work in us. And oh, dear friend, we're so close to the end. Jesus is coming. We only have a little bit of time. Surrender your heart. Surrender your soul to him. Let the Lord Jesus Christ work in your life. Let him shine forth from your life in all of his glory and all of his righteousness and all of his life, love that you and I may reflect his glory to those about us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the assurance of your word, the promise that Jesus is coming soon and that each one of us can be among those that will stand on the sea of glass, clothed in white robes and palm branches in our hands and sing praises to you. Grant to us, Lord, the grace. Grant to us the opportunity to follow you and to worship you. Bless each one here tonight. May they reach out in faith, take hold of the promises of your word, we ask in Christ's name, amen. Our next presentation is on the seven trumpets. Seven trumpets. As I mentioned earlier, I don't really recommend this as a subject for little children. So I would uh, encourage you to be sure, be here, bring your pencil and paper as we take a look, because these are the judgments of God and what he has to say is going to happen. Good night. God bless you. Every day, thousands risk their lives to protect and serve their fellow men. They have a deep commitment to excellency and teamwork. And when others run from danger, they run to it. Even if it means personal sacrifice. Even if it means making the supreme sacrifice for another. They're always on call, ready to serve, no matter what. Friends, you and I can learn a lot from firefighters. In the United States, the majority of them are volunteers. That's right, volunteers. But even for those who are paid, it's more than a job, it's a calling. Jesus said in John 15, verses 12 and 13, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Those who follow the words of Jesus are his friends. 
But Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrated His own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What an amazing thought. Christ laid down His life for us, even though we were not His friends. A firefighter is willing to do the same. He's constantly preparing for his next mission because his own life and the life of others depends on his training and qualifications. My friends, that's what we're doing right now with this series. We are preparing you for what is to come. Our goal is to make you skilled in the Word so that by the power of God you can bring others to safety the safety that can be found only in the arms of a loving Savior. Won't you help us to train and prepare others to fulfill this mission? Please consider what you can do for those who still don't know about Jesus. As the Holy Spirit impresses, please send your tax-deductible gifts to Kenneth Cox Ministries, Post Office Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or call us toll-free at 888- 747-1844. Thank you for helping us spread the light of God's Word through television. Your gifts bring the blessed hope of salvation to millions around the world. The Revelation of Jesus Christ is available on DVD. Each individual program from the second series, Revelations from God's Throne Room, may be received on a single DVD for only $10 plus shipping and handling. The entire seven-part series, including Worthy is the Lamb, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, The 144,000, The Seven Trumpets, The Time of the End, The Two Witnesses, and War in Heaven may be ordered as a set for $59.95, which includes shipping and handling. To order, call 1-888-747-1844 or write to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or you may order online at kennethcoxministries.org. The Revelation of Jesus Christ on DVD. Each individual message on a single DVD or in a set. It's a great way to share this life-changing message with your family, friends, and neighbors.